This is Nelson Olmstead. Sleep no more. No more. Turn down the lights. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror, told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible, fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmstead, tell us about this evening's story. Thank you, Ben. Some time ago, a listener wrote asking me to do a particular story which I told a number of years ago. Frankly, I was surprised she could remember so well. But the story is like that. I have never been able to forget it myself. And I'd like to tell it to you again tonight as our first offering. This is a story of a man who thought he could hate people with impunity. Written by Walker G. Everett, it's entitled, The Woman in Gray. Bill was at a dinner party at the Carters when the subject first came up, a dinner to which he would never have gone if he could have thought of a single plausible excuse. Sarah Carter had a girl visiting her from the East, her school roommate or something, Bill thought vaguely. Bill was her dinner partner. They were talking about some people she didn't like, and she said, yes, and and they told it all over town that I was the girl who was caught in the raid and that I had a red wig on so nobody would know me. Oh, how I wish I could get even with them, the most hateful people. Now, haven't you any suggestions? Bill looked pensive. Many martinis had set up a pleasant buzzing in his brain, and everything in life seemed very easy, and he said... Well, you might tell everybody that they have a repulsive daughter hidden away that nobody ever sees, and that's why they don't like young men calling at the house. (laughs) No, that's too easy. They have three daughters, all repulsive, only not hidden away. That is, yet. In that case, I don't know. Uh, Well, why don't you just leave it to me? What do you mean? Do you make little wax images and stick pins in them? Ah, there she'd stolen a march on them, because that was just what he'd been going to say. So he took a piece of celery, applied his mental spurs to himself, and came out in an inspiration. Oh, uh, haven't I ever told you about the lady in gray? No. Who is she? Just the lady in gray. Well, where is she? Right here beside me now. Where? Oh, you can't see her. I'm the only one who can see her, but she's right here by me all the time. I've known her for years. Goodness gracious. Aren't you scared? Doesn't she uh, haunt you? Oh, no, she likes me. That's why she stays here. Isn't it, lady? He turned and nodded to the imaginary figure beside him. Well, of course, she's very modest and goes out of the room when I'm undressed, but all the rest of the time, she's here. (laughs) Even her face is gray. Well, doesn't she do anything at all? Certainly. She gets after people I don't like. How terrible. Well, uh, sick her on the quarries in Hartford, Connecticut, then, and tell her to do her worst. I will. Right now. Do you hear that, lady in gray? Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, Quarry's the name. The third house from the corner on the left. I don't want any mistake. Oh, she never makes a mistake, said Bill. He was rather pleased with his little joke as he finished the last of his martini. That was the last Bill thought about it for two weeks until Sarah Carter plowed across the room at a cocktail party and said, Now, what's this all about the lady in gray? Well, I don't know, said Bill. What do you mean? I had a letter from Elsa. She said to tell you your lady in gray did the work a little too well and you'd better be careful. Hmm? What else did she say? Something about a family named Quarry. They they had an automobile accident and all died. Five, I think. Hmm. 
Wow, what a coincidence. And what a story. He lost no time in telling it around, of course. It was a good story, with enough of pleasant actual horror in it, but not too much, the quarries remaining mythical, so that it was worth a chill and a laugh any place. Two weeks later, he was at a dinner at Corrine Gorman's house, a fine, old-fashioned dinner, with old-fashioned cocktails before, new-fashioned highballs after, and good old-fashioned screaming all the way through. Bill sat by Corrine. She turned to him and pointed to two empty seats. Oh, you know, I, I could kill those people, she said. They're always hours late anyway, and finally they phone from Winnetka that they've broken down. Now, why don't you sick your lady in gray on them for me? Well, I would, but I don't hate them. I don't want them to turn over like the quarries. How well do you know them? Not very well. Well, I can tell you some things. They've named their children Peggy Jean and Michael Peter... They have some name for their car, and they go to the circus every year and laugh and laugh and eat Cracker Jack and peanuts. That's the kind of people they are. Oh, well, I'd just as soon hate them for myself. Sure, I'll send the gray lady after them. Only they'd better look out. That was the last they thought about it until the dinner was nearly over and Corrine was called to the telephone, and she came back white. It was they, she whispered. Terrible accident. A taxi hit them. Uh, don't tell anybody for a minute. Oh. Were they badly hurt? Yes. He uh, wondered suddenly if he ought to say anything about the absurd conversation regarding the lady in gray. He decided not. Two coincidences were just a little too much. Yet he knew there was nothing in it. Hadn't he made her up out of a clear sky just to amuse the guest of Sarah Carter? But just the same, he felt it would be a little smart alecky to allude to it. However, Corrine soon saved him the trouble, and she said, Never mention that gray woman again. Never, never. Oh, well, that didn't have anything to do with it. You know that. Yes, but it's a little too strange, that's all. As if Santa Claus should suddenly come down the chimney. Or you find a baby in a cabbage. I think that would be a great improvement. But this isn't any time to be funny. <laughs> But the story leaked out, and Bill's Lady in Grey became even more famous. It's the funniest thing, people said. Somebody ought to send it into the New Yorker. And you know, Bill is such a scream about it. He's afraid to hate anybody now, he says, for fear she'll get after them. And he's going to rent her out to the government if we ever get into a war. But Bill didn't think he was funny. He thought this, while not exactly playing with fire, was at least in bad taste. He didn't think he was in very good taste anyway. For about this time, he had a bad week. Seven nights of drinking and running around town, and cashing checks all the time with a low, wormish feeling of approaching reckoning under the talking of nightly parties to get over yesterday's hangover. And every day, down at the office, getting blearier, going to the water cooler with the aspirin bottle in his hand and standing blindly in the window when the terrible 11.30 nausea swept over him in waves. But he didn't know what to do because life didn't have much meaning anyway, and he was having a better time than most people. One warm night, it was the next Monday, he sat in his room alone. The window was open on blackness. The curtains were limp. His electric fan turned its flat face wearily from side to side, stirring up an ineffectual commotion in the air. The phone rang. It was the doorman who said, Mr. Jacobson to see you. Tell him to come up. Well, what could he want? Jacobson from the office, unctuous and self-righteous. Why, well, I hardly knew the man. The doorbell buzzed. Come in. Good evening. Good evening. Jacobson came in and sat down. Well, warm, isn't it? Yeah, terribly. You uh, probably wonder why I'm here. Jacobson's mouse-like eyes took in the empty highball glass, the bowl of melted ice. Well, uh, yes, I do. Uh, you want a drink? No, thanks. <laughs> no, I never touch it. Oh, okay. Now, what I uh, wanted to see you about is this. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Selfridge uh, asked me to have a little talk with you, you know, a friendly chat, merely, uh, between friends. Yes. It's uh, about your work. <laughs> a word to the wise, does it work? Oh, have I been lying down on the job? Am, 
Am I going to get the gate? Oh, no, no, not that. But uh, the first, perhaps, a trifle? <laughs> a little too many parties, eh? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Selfridge thought that just a quiet tip from a friend. I see. Uh, thank you. Oh, not at all, not at all. It's a pleasure. Yes, I don't doubt it. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't mean that. <laughs> well, I'll be running along. Jacobson got up. Uh, nice little place you got here. Yes, I like it. Oh, how he hated the man. Why didn't he go? Well, I'd better go. I got a new convertible downstairs. I have to go slow. It'll take me a while. I live in the suburbs, you know. Oh, you do? Uh, how do you like it? Oh, it's a fine little bus. <laughs> yeah, you can see it from the window. I'll look out. Good night. Good night. <laughs> see you tomorrow. Lug in this convertible, thought Bill. I wish. He went to the window and looked out. Presently, Jacobson came out, climbed into a little yellow car, started out, and drove straight into the side of a big truck that had swung around the corner with a horrible ripping and blasting noise. After a long time, Bill whispered, No, no, it can't be. He waited until he saw people like sudden ants flocking, and then he came back, poured himself a drink, and sat down on the couch. It had happened again, and just after being told all that about his job, everything he did seemed to be wrong, and it was all his own fault. He gulped down his drink and made another, stronger. The light seemed so bright, made the room look so empty, with only those two black holes of windows. So he turned them out and sat in the single ray that came from the bathroom. When the lights were out, the room changed. The black windows became gradually a soft, warm blue, like a promise of day to come. It was the room that was dark. But Bill just sat there a long time without moving. Finally, he put his hands over his eyes and whispered, I hate myself. Then the door opened, and in came the lady in gray, now, it wasn't anyone dressed up to frighten him or his sister come to call. It was the lady in gray, and Bill knew it. He looked at her steadily as she came nearer, quietly, delicately. He felt his brains run down the inside of his skull like melting drugstore ice. The room started to rock and then swirl faster and faster. Finally, she was halfway across the room, and he threw his glass at her. It smashed against the opposite wall. Bill stood up and whirled around. The whole room was swinging in a grayish haze. He turned to the window. They found him the next morning on the second floor fire escape, one of those horizontal ones with a weight on the end. He had landed almost in the middle and was doing a ghastly little teeter-totter. A ghastly little story, too, Nelson Olmsted. I can understand now why your listener was never able to forget the woman in gray. But what is your second story tonight? It's a story by Algernon Blackwood, Ben, a name in modern short story literature that is synonymous with a particularly frightening kind of narrative. Blackwood writes with a weird sincerity about the spirit world and the supernatural. This tale we're about to hear is a masterful one about a man who suddenly finds himself irrevocably involved in a crime of which he is innocent. It's a story of suspense called A Suspicious Gift. Blake had been in very low water for months, almost underwater part of the time, due to circumstances which he was fond of saying were no fault of his own. And as he sat writing in his room on the third floor back of a New York boarding house, Part of his mind was busily occupied in wondering when his luck was going to turn again. In the daytime, he was a reporter on an evening newspaper of sensational and lying habits. His work was chiefly in the police courts, and in his spare hours at night, when not too tired or too hungry, he wrote sketches and stories for the magazines that very rarely saw the light of day. On this particular evening, Blake sat scribbling by the only window that wasn't cracked. His thoughts kept wandering to food, 
beefsteak and steaming vegetables. He pulled himself together and again attacked the problem. As he did so, there came a gentle knock at the door and Blake started. The knock was repeated louder. Who in the world could it be at this late hour of night? And he said, come in. The door opened in response and the man came in. Blake didn't turn around at once and the other advanced to the center of the room, but without speaking. Then Blake knew it was no one from the boarding house and turned around. He saw a man, about 40, standing in the middle of the carpet, but standing sideways so that he didn't present a full face. He wore an overcoat buttoned at the neck, and on the felt hat which he held in front of him, fresh raindrops glistened. In the other hand, he carried a small black bag. Blake gave him a good look and came to the conclusion that he might be a secretary or a chief clerk or a confidential man of sorts. There was something singular about this man, something far out of the common, though for the life of him, Blake couldn't say what it was. The fellow was out of the ordinary and in some very undesirable manner. He spoke in a quiet, respectful voice. Are you Mr. Blake? I am. Mr. Arthur Blake? Yes. Mr. Arthur Herbert Blake? Well, that's my full name. Uh, Won't you sit down, please? The man advanced with a curious sideways motion like a crab and took a seat on the edge of the sofa. He put his hat on the floor at his feet, but still kept the bag in his hand. I come to you from a friend who wishes you well. A friend of mine? Just so. A friend of yours. A man or a woman? That I cannot tell you. You can't tell me? I cannot tell you the name. Those are my instructions, but I bring you something from this person. I am to give it to you, to take a receipt for it, and then to go away without answering any question. Blake stared very hard. The man, however, never raised his eyes above the level of the second china knob on the chest of drawers opposite. Uh, What have you got for me, please? By way of answer, the man proceeded to open the bag. He took out a parcel wrapped loosely in brown paper. When at last the string was off and the paper unfolded, there appeared a series of smaller packages inside. The man took them out very carefully and set them in a row upon his knees. They were all... $100 $100 bills. There are $10,000 here, and they are for you. What? $10,000? $10,000? Are you sure? I mean, what, you mean, you mean they're, they're for me? He felt quite silly with excitement and grew more so with every minute as the man maintained a perfect silence. Was it a dream? He couldn't believe his ears or his eyes. Yet, in a sense, it was possible. He had read of such things in books, the generous philanthropist who was determined to do his good deed and to get no thanks or acknowledgement for it. Still, it seemed almost incredible. His troubles began to melt away like bubbles in the sun. He thought of the landlady and the arrears of rent, of regular food and clean linen and books and music, of the chance of getting into some respectable business, of... Well, of as many things as it's possible to think of when excitement and surprise fling wide open the gates of the imagination. But side by side with the excitement caused by the shock of such an event, Blake's caution was beginning to assert itself. It all seemed just a little too much out of the likely order of things to be quite right. The police courts had taught him the amazing ingenuity of the criminal mind, as well as something of the plots and devices of which the unwary are beguiled into the dark places where blackmail may be levied with impunity. The only weak point in the supposition that this was part of some such proceeding was the selection of himself, a poor newspaper reporter, as a victim. It did seem absurd. But then the whole thing was so out of the ordinary, and the thought, once having entered his mind, wasn't so easily got rid of. Blake resolved to be very cautious. The man, meanwhile though he never appeared to raise his eyes from the carpet, had been watching him closely all the time. If you will give me a receipt, I'll leave the money at once. He said this with a touch of impatience in his tone, as if he were anxious to bring the matter to a conclusion as soon as possible. But, now, wait a minute. You say it's quite impossible for you to tell me the name of the well-wisher or why he sends me such a large sum of money in this extraordinary way? The money is sent to you because you are in need of it. It's a present without conditions of any sort attached. 
You have to give me a receipt only to satisfy the sender that it has reached your hands. The money will never be asked of you again. Well, suddenly, it flashed across Blake's mind that if he took the money and gave the receipt before a witness, nothing very disastrous could come of the affair. It would protect him against blackmail, if this was, after all, a plot of some sort with blackmail in it. Or, in case the man were a madman or a criminal who was getting rid of a portion of his ill-gotten gains to divert suspicion, there was no great harm done, and he could hold the money till it was claimed or advertised for in the newspapers. Uh, I'll take the money, he said. Although, I must say, it seems to me a very unusual transaction. And I'll give you such a receipt as I think proper under the circumstances. A proper receipt is all I want. I mean by that a receipt before a proper witness. Perfectly satisfactory. Only it must be dated and headed with your address here in the correct way. Well, Blake could see no possible objection to this, and he at once proceeded to obtain his witness. The person he had in mind was a Mr. Barkley who occupied the room above his own, an old gentleman who had retired from business and who, the landlady said, was a miser and kept large sums secreted in his room. He was, at any rate, a perfectly respectable man and would make an admirable witness to a transaction of this sort. Blake made an apology and rose to get him, crossing the room in front of the sofa where the man sat in order to reach the door. As he did so, he saw for the first time the other side of the visitor's face, the side that had been always so carefully turned away from him. There was a broad smear of blood down the skin from the ear to the neck. It glistened in the gaslight. Blake never knew how he managed to smother the cry that sprang to his lips, but smother it he did. In a second he was at the door, his knees trembling, his mind in a sudden and dreadful turmoil. His main object, so far as he could recollect afterwards, was to escape from the room as if he noticed nothing, so as not to arouse the other suspicions. The man's eyes were always on the carpet, and probably, Blake hoped, he had not noticed the consternation that must have been written plainly on his face. At any rate, he had uttered no cry. In another second, he would have been in the passage when suddenly he met a pair of wicked, staring eyes fixed intently and with a cunning smile upon his own. In the mirror, the visitor was calmly watching his every movement. He tore upstairs, his heart in his mouth. Barclay must come to his aid. This matter was serious, perhaps horribly serious. Taking the money or giving a receipt or having anything at all to do with it became an impossibility. Here was crime. He felt certain of it. He reached the next landing and began to hammer at the old miser's door as if his very life depended on it. He got no answer. He turned the handle and walked into the room, and to his immense relief, he saw the old man lying asleep in the bed. Blake opened the door to its widest to get more light and then walked in quickly. Something clutched at his heart as he looked closer. He stumbled over a chair and found the matches, calling upon Barclay the whole time to wake up and come downstairs with him. He blundered across the floor and lit the gas over the table. In the full glare, he saw the old man lying huddled up into a ghastly heap on the bed, his throat cut across from ear to ear. And all over the carpet lay new dollar bills, crisp and clean like those he had left downstairs, and strewn about in little heaps. For a moment... Blake stood stock still, bereft of all power of movement. The next, his courage returned, and he fled from the room and dashed downstairs. He reached the bottom and tore along the passage to his room, determined at any rate to seize the man and prevent his escape until help came. But when he got to the end of the little landing, he found that his door had been closed, and he seized the handle, fumbling with it in his violence. It, it felt slippery and kept turning under his fingers without opening the door, and fully half a minute passed before it yielded and let him in headlong. At first glance, he saw the room was empty and the man gone. Scattered upon the carpet lay a number of bills, and beside them, half hidden under the sofa where the man had sat, he saw a pair of gloves, thick leather gloves, and a butcher's knife. Even from the distance where he stood, the blood stains on both were easily visible. Dazed and confused by the terrible discoveries of the last few minutes, Blake stood in the middle of the room, overwhelmed and unable to think or move. And consciously, he must have passed his hand over his forehead, for he noticed that the skin felt wet and sticky. His hand was covered with blood. And when he rushed in terror to the looking glass, he saw that there was a broad red smear across his face and forehead. Then he remembered the slippery handle of the door and knew that it had been carefully moistened in an instant, the whole plot became clear as daylight, and he was so spellbound with horror that a sort of numbness came over him, and he came very near to fainting. At this moment, there came a loud knocking at his door. It was the police, 
And all Blake could do was to laugh foolishly to himself and wait till they were upon him. He couldn't move or speak. He stood face to face with the evidence of his horrid crime, his hands and his face smeared with the blood of his victim. And a voice, which he knew very well, said, Here it is, third floor back, and the fellow caught red-handed. It was the man with the bag leading in the two policemen. Hardly knowing what he was doing in the fearful stress of conflicting emotions, he made a step forward. But before he had time to make a second one, the two policemen moved up to seize him. His only thought was that there was nothing he could do. Nothing he could do. can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right, isn't it? Thank you, Nelson Olmsted, for two exciting stories. The Woman in Gray by Walker G. Everett and The Suspicious Gift by Algernon Blackwood. Now, what about next week? Well, Ben, next week I plan to present two stories which I think you'll like very much. One is a narrative which has popped into my mind at the oddest and most unexpected moments. I've never been able to forget it. I've even tried to imagine what I would do under similar circumstances. It concerns a man who made a fantastic wager. He bet that for $2 million, he could spend 15 years in solitary confinement. Would you do it? Anton Chekhov writes a vivid story about the bet. Our second tale is by George Moore, entitled The Clerk's Quest. The human mind is universally enigmatic. Like fingerprints, no two form the same pattern, and no two run the same course of emotion. Because of our ignorance as to the operation of the human mind, great writers have been fascinated with the subject. George Moore's story is an example it concerns a poor bank clerk who smells perfume on an envelope and because of it falls disastrously in love with a woman he never sees. Be with us next week. May I add just a word of thanks for your letters. We have been immensely pleased that so many of you have taken the time to write. Thank you for your interest. <laughs> You have been listening to Sleep No More, an NBC Radio Network production directed by Kenneth McGregor. Mr. Armstead's albums are recorded exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week, when Nelson Armstead will again be here in person, this is Ben Grauer bidding you good night. Good night.